it is really an honor <clears throat> and so much fun to be here. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun preparing this talk. Uh, each time I give this talk, things change and I learn more about, about the training program. You know, I've been a psychiatrist for uh, 25 years. And when I first trained, uh, I did an anxiety disorders fellowship. And I started teaching about anxiety and anxiety disorders. And that was a hard topic to like get a big picture of and to do in an interdisciplinary way. And then I started working with addictions and teaching about that. And then gender and sexuality. And each one had its own challenges in terms of how to teach residents and fellows uh, about how to practice in some way that was not just cookbook and you know, cookie cutter about this is how you treat this problem in this way. But I think that psychedelic psychotherapy training has been the most challenging thing that I have ever undertaken. Uh, and it continues to teach me a lot about doing therapy and being with patients and in, in teaching. So I'm going to try to cover a number of different topics in my talk today. I want to ask the question, what is psychedelic psychotherapy? And in particular, what is psychedelic psychotherapy that we do at NYU with the participants in our cancer anxiety study? I answered this question uh, by looking at who is doing psychedelic psychotherapy today, who actively participates in offering and in consuming psychedelic therapy, and also with some of the, some of the uh, methods and techniques that are important, even if psychedelics are not involved. Uh, I'm going to show a little bit about what it is that we actually do with participants that are in our study, what kinds of experiences they actually undergo when they, uh, they go through the work with us. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about how we train our therapists, what kinds of experiences we put them through, what kind of teaching we do, and uh, how it is that we conceive of their going from one place to another. I want to ask the question, why do we call it therapy? And the theme that you're going to hear me uh, address throughout the talk today is why this is therapy and why we are not guides or monitors or sitters, but we are therapists who are doing therapy with patients. We call them participants or subjects, but for the clinical work that we're doing, it is really therapists who are very well trained, who are sitting with human beings that are suffering, and we're doing a short-term therapy that has psilocybin sessions that are part of it. And I'm going to close by asking, what are the goals of our training program? What do we really hope to accomplish in training people to work in the study? So what is psychedelic psychotherapy? It is a collection of psychotherapeutic processes that are facilitated by psychedelic agents. So the important part here is that psychedelic therapy has as its basis a therapeutic process which already exists in the mind of the therapist and in many ways in the mind of the, uh, the participant when they come in. All of the experience, all of the training that they've had, the patients or the participants experience in therapy, all of this comes to bear on what happens to people when they enter our research project. And in this way, it's distinct from uh, psychedelic agents as neuroscientific probes into the function of the brain and the mind. And it's also uh, different in some important ways from uh, psychedelic journeys that are undertaken for a recreational purpose or for a uh, spiritual purpose or uh, for artistic creativity or individually. So this is very specifically therapy that's done with people who are suffering from a certain uh, condition. So what we do is not shamanic healing, it is not sh neo-shamanic healing, however, it does absorb uh, many of the uh, core teachings and the wisdom that come from those traditions. Psychedelic therapy is deeply embedded in, inextricably embedded in the knowledge systems of the subject and the guide. Here we see Copernicus looking at the sky with a very primitive telescope. And what Copernicus saw, the data that he gathered, how he interpreted it, was all very much based in what he knew about the heavens and what he thought was going on in the heavens. Now, he may have seen things that surprised him that caused him to revise what he thought, but basically w what happened with that telescope was profoundly influenced by what he expected to see, what he was surprised by, and the basic knowledge base that was going on in his culture at that time. 300 years later, we have a much fancier uh, instrument looking at the sky, but it's more or less the same sky and more or less the same kind of instrument. But the way that da data was gathered, the questions that were asked, the way the data was manipulated and interpreted, and the kinds of impressions that were drawn from it was very, very different. 
However, same kind of instrument and same kind of sky. So this shows how deeply uh, it is the, in the mind of the observer and the looker and the person that's participating in the experience that um, uh, the catalyst or the technology, which in our case is psychedelics, you know, has to be understood. So I want to reintroduce uh, the idea of psycholytic therapy. Psycholytic therapy is, is uh, much referenced, but not that much talked about anymore. It's a kind of therapy that was done in the 50s and 60s. It was existed more in Europe than in America, although there was quite a bit of psycholytic therapy that happened here. But in the modern psychedelic uh, research renaissance, uh, there's much more emphasis on psychedelic therapy, which is, if you want to be, and this is quite reductionist though, to say that psychedelic therapy has ego death brought about by the agent, followed by a peak spiritual or mystical experience. So this tends to be more unitary in concept. That is, it's more or less the same for everyone. And in fact, all of you have probably seen the nine, the list of nine criteria that define a mystical experience. And in our study, we like measure people to say how many of them they've accomplished. You know, do they get three or four or five? And if they get nine, then they've had a complete mystical experience. So. In this way, uh, the, the idea is towards a kind of a universal experience, and this is seen as having somewhat magical properties to heal. Uh, it's brought about, it brings about decreased death anxiety and transformation in character, which is seen, and it's sort of a goal that people uh, look for in research. However, it is a goal which is deeply bedded in contextualization. Uh, it's more likely to happen with someone who's prepared for it and who knows how to uh, experience it. It's not like it never happens in unprepared people, but in our, in our study, people who are experienced meditators and have worked with ego death as it occurs in, in meditation retreats, uh, that kind of person is more likely to experience ego death followed by a spiritual or mystical experience. Uh, and this, the, quasi-religious preparation is, you know, um, more likely to bring this about for this kind of individual. And in this case, the therapy supports the medicine experience. So the goal of the therapist and the context is to support this profound and shattering medicine experience. Psycholytic therapy, on the other hand, is more biographical and more psychodynamic. <clears throat> it's more individualized and more has to do with that individual's time on the earth, their experiences in childhood and adulthood, and it's also deeply embedded in the relationship with the therapists who are in the room. In this way, the medicine supports the therapy experience, and there's a lot of writing that happened about psycholytic therapy that advanced whatever kind of therapy that patient and that therapist were doing in the 50s and 60s. If they were Jungian therapists or Freudian therapists or Rogerian or relational therapists, the, uh, the psychedelic experience used in a psycholytic manner advanced that particular kind of therapy. Uh, in our study, we measure and we look for a mystical or spiritual experience, but many people have a combination of a psycholytic and a psychedelic experience, and some people have only a psycholytic experience. And this falls then, of course, to the therapists to interpret this and help the, uh, the patient, work, help the uh, participant work with it in a meaningful way. Uh, to, to make this point yet one more time, Anais Nin said, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. So why is this point so important? Why do I uh, hammer away at this point? Because when you teach uh, a certain kind of therapy, you're called upon to explain much of the basis of that therapy, how it works, why it works, what you're doing, what distinguishes it from other kinds of therapy? And these are very difficult questions to answer about psychedelic therapy for many reasons. One is that it's not been done uh, very much in the last 40 years in an over at ground, above board way. Um, and secondly, because there are so many different forms of psychedelic therapy. But when you want to teach something, especially in a rather traditional setting like we have at NYU, you um, have to have a, a matrix or a structure in which you're setting out to teach a body of knowledge to therapists who don't have it. So you have to decide, what is the body of knowledge? What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Uh, most people would agree that uh, we are opening up something inside. So what are we opening up to with psychedelics? Why are we opening up to this? Why do we think it's a good idea to unleash or open up these kinds of restrictions that happen in the brain um, naturally for a period of six or eight or 10 or 12 hours? Why was it closed in the first place? 
What are we looking for? And are we instead opening up to something outside the self rather than inside the self? And these are all questions which it's easy to ask, but when you teach it, it's important to have some answers, and yet these are answers that we don't really have immediately at hand. So an important question, how do we develop new narratives out of being involved in the study? That is, how do, how do the people who come to us for help come away feeling better, feeling more like their life is more meaningful, less afraid of death, and deeper engaged with the life that they have, and able to, to know and experience that and speak of it? What can help these changes become long-lasting? All of these are questions which go into teaching psychedelic therapy, and they're questions which I wouldn't say that I have all the answers to, which makes it especially hard to teach. Um, and when you, when you work at NYU or any uh, a academic setting, you uh, really have to make certain that what you're doing fits into quite a tra traditional model of education. So uh, part of the goal that we're uh, grappling with is how to develop a coherent model for teaching psychedelic assisted therapy to conventionally trained therapists. All of the people that have been through our training program are trained and have extensive experience in working with patients either as psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, or social workers, or family therapists. So they're all fully trained therapists. And how do we teach this additional method or this additional kind of intervention? Or how do we teach therapists that know how to work with patients then to use this new kind of experience using their own unique skills and abilities and in some way trying to bring about a coherent kind of treatment? Because if you're saying this is psychedelic psychotherapy, you're defining it as something specific. You're saying this is a certain kind of therapy, this is what it is, and this is what it isn't. And those kind of boundaries which are problematic in, in uh, um, if you think about things in a holistic way or in a non-dual way, that isn't the way that psychiatry works. You know, if you're defining a certain kind of therapy and you want to, say, have a fellowship in psychedelic psychotherapy, then the chairman is going to say, well, what is that? And how do you know it's something? And how do you know when someone's doing it? And how do you know when someone's doing it well? And how do you know if somebody's not doing it, but it looks like they are? And these are all questions that you have to have at least practical answers to. You also want to answer questions like, who can become a psychedelic therapist? Who should become a psychedelic therapist and who shouldn't? We tried to answer the question, how is our work different from the psychedelic therapy that's done by underground uh, workers, of which hundreds if not thousands of uh, sessions you know, are, you know, happen every year? And how do we integrate our training with the therapist's existing uh, approaches? And how do we bring our responsibilities as uh, you know, trained professional therapists uh, to the uh, psychedelic therapy setting. So this is the title of our study, Effects of Psilocybin-Assisted Psychotherapy on Anxiety and Psychosocial Distress in Cancer Patients. Uh, this therapy occurs in a very specific context. It occurs in Manhattan at NYU. Uh, this is our, uh, our research center in the upper right-hand corner, Bluestone Center for Clinical Research. Um, People walk around with white coats on and stethoscopes around their necks. And so uh, the people who come are, for the most part, very mainstream uh, individuals who have cancer. Some of them quite advanced cancer. Some people are not too ill, but many people are quite ill. Uh, and they're involved with uh, traditional uh, cancer regimens, uh, with scans, uh, radiation, chemotherapy. Uh, and these are the patients who come to us uh, and enter our study, by and large. These are the members uh, of the NYU team. Steve Ross, who I think might be here in the room. Steve? Over there. Over there. And uh, Tony Bosses, who spoke on the first day of the conference. Uh, Gabby egan Liebes, who might be here also. Over there. And, oops. Carrie Turnbull, uh, Director of Development. Alexander Belser, who might be here. Alex? No. Uh, and Effie Nolman, uh, another consultant and somebody who helps us with uh, development. And this is an overview of our study. For those of you who uh, aren't familiar with uh, what it is that we're doing, I thought I would show you what it is that the therapists do in our study and what it is that we're pre pre preparing them to do. There are two dosing sessions, dosing A and dosing B. They're separated by a seven-week period. Before dosing session A, there are three preparatory sessions. These are about two hours long. 
Then there's dosing session A, which is either placebo or active drug. Uh, no one knows, not the participant or the therapist or the PI or anybody. The only person who knows is the compounder who actually makes up the pill on a milligram per kilogram basis and puts it into a, uh, a special uh, envelope and then a special bottle, and it's all very special. Uh, <laughs> after, uh, after dosing session A, there's a seven-week period and then there are integrative psychotherapy sessions. Now, if the person received placebo, or if it appears to everyone that they got placebo, then those next three sessions tend to be more continued preparation because uh, the experience with psilocybin is definitely the high point of the experience. So they either have, in, 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 in essence, six preparatory sessions and three integrative, or three preparatory and six integrative sessions. And there's a subtle, you know, well, there's not so subtle uh, dynamic differences that happen when a person is disappointed if they didn't get active drug first, but everyone knows that by the end of the study, they will have received uh, a dosing session in both conditions. So after the dosing session B, then there is um, you know, a period of about four weeks or five weeks during which there are three more uh, integration sessions. So we have nine therapy sessions and two dosing sessions. Who are the psychedelic therapists of today? In order to uh, you know, think about what we needed to learn, what we needed to do, I, I asked myself the question, who is doing work with psychedelics and who is doing work that feels um, related to um, uh, psychedelic therapy? Uh, and I came up with four categories, the shaman, the neo-shaman, the meditation adept, and the palliative care therapist and psychodynamic therapist of today. And I'm going to go through each one and talk a little bit about what we learned from them and what I think we needed to, to incorporate from these different um, uh, disciplines. The, uh, the shaman is the earliest and longest lasting psychothera uh, longest, uh, uh, longest known psychotherapist in recorded history. A core of shamanism is communication with the spirit world. This occurs quite concretely. It's not metaphor. It's not... Um, uh, an aspect of, uh, of the mind. It is uh, a literal communication with spirits and the ability to work with unseen and mysterious forces and to intercede for the benefit of the sufferer is a core activity of the shaman. The shaman enters a trance state uh, voluntarily, either with or without psychedelics, and experience their soul or spirit leaving the body or journeying or traveling on the, on behalf of the individual who is suffering. The shaman interacts with spirits and will command, intercede, or commune with them in some way in order to bring about a benefit for the individual who is in the ceremony or for the tribe or community as a whole. There's a, quite a similarity between shamanic training and psychoanalytic training. In both, uh, the individual, by definition, suffers from some kind of malady, some kind of unhappiness, or frustration, or fear, or anguish, uh, some kind of suffering which is both defined by and treated by a particular knowledge system. In order to become a psychoanalyst, you have to be you know, upset and neurotic or troubled in some way, <laughs> seek trouble, no, seek treatment with a, a, uh, an analyst and undergo a genuinely therapeutic uh, psychoanalytic process. And anybody who doesn't do that is probably not going to be very much uh, uh, much good as a psychoanalyst because enthusiasm for the method is a requirement for practicing it uh, effectively. And also, you learn a great deal about what it means to be a patient and what it means to be a therapist from working with your own analyst. So the analyst as well as the shaman suffer from some kind of uh, malady and often both are, you know, like marked at a very early age as, uh, you know, headed towards a particular career. This is true for many, many therapists. And so this malady is cured or ameliorated in some way by shamanic practices or by a psychoanalytic practice. And this is the embodiment of the wounded healer paradigm in which the person who's uh, conducting the ceremony or conducting the analysis is not expected to be perfect or flawless, uh, but in, in fact is expected to be someone who lives with a spirit wound and is working at healing it or has had it healed in some way and develop compassion and a unique ability to relate to other people as, as part part of that process. Part of the culmination of a, of a shamanic quest, and this is quite different from psychoanalytic training, is a confrontation with death. This confrontation with death, 
which often is accentuated in, in the psychedelic experiences, is a catalyst for moving to a different stage of being. Without the encounter with death and the experience of dying, either in a trance state, uh, you know, non-psychedelically induced or, or with medicine, uh, the reaching out, the, the, the hunger, the need, the ex expansion and, ex and extension of oneself to find a new way of relating to life, to oneself, it doesn't happen. And so it is this very terror and reaching through um, the sense of, of, of groundlessness and uh, shattering that transformation and rebirth can occur. And this is one of the things that is most important, I think, for therapists to be able to work with uh, participants in the study. And in order to approximate this, uh, we have a great deal of emphasis in the training process on confrontation with one's own mortality, fears about death, and experiences of death and mortality in friends and family and in, in patients. The shamanic, the shamanic practitioner may uh, take medicines, and as I'm sure everyone here knows, the practice may uh, be that the shaman takes the medicine, not the patient or the seeker or the sufferer in their culture. Um, that is not what happens in our study. In our study, it is the person with cancer anxiety who takes the medicine and the, uh, the therapist in the room with him or with her are uh, quite sober. Although there sometimes is kind of a contagious experience of entering trance with them, but we're all sober, pharmacologically speaking. And in shamanism, psychedelic plants are considered gifts of the god. They are mediators between the gods and humans and may carry special communicative potential. And it is the, uh, also some believe that it is the plant itself that is the god. And the plant contains the spirit power. Uh, mushrooms are found widely available in uh, nature if you know where to look and you know when to look. They are not secreted away and they are not expensive. You just need to know what to do with them, where to find them, and how to use them. In research, a mole the molecules of psilocybin are considered to be inert and to not have spirit within themselves, and yet <clears throat> they're considered to be very dangerous. And we had to install a very expensive and huge safe in order to protect a relatively small amount of psilocybin. It's weighed every day. And there is some kind of danger that exists uh, with the human beings around the psilocybin because it needs some, this much protection. So while these mushrooms are available growing in cow dung in certain places, when they arrive at First Avenue and 25th Street, <laughs> We need a big safe to keep, to keep everybody feeling okay about it. Now, the shaman is a person who exists at the margins of society, but that doesn't mean that he or she is a countercultural agent because those who exist at the margins are very much part of culture, very much part of society. In fact, the center can't define itself if there isn't a margin against which it can uh, say, well, we are not that, uh, but we're glad that person is here because we can uh, find what we don't have in ourselves in them or we can, you know, we can hate them or we just need them in some way. But the shaman, while perhaps a person marginalized in society, is a very well-known and respected and valued person in society. So there are culturally bound narratives of illness and healing that the shaman knows and that the other members of the community know. So even before a person goes to a shaman, what's wrong, how it gets better, who's gonna do what, all of these are, are cultural narratives that exist uh, you know, as, as part of the culture. There's a highly ritualized uh, training process with a strong respect for tradition. So although working with psychedelics is um, uh, countercultural and edgy and kind of uh, uh, outlaw-ish in, uh, in the underground circles in uh, the Western world, I think within indigenous cultures, it's not, it's not that way at all. There is a training program um, and there's an apprenticeship, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and it also may be part of the, shaman, the shaman's job in ceremony to reinforce pro-social values and social regulation. And in fact, it's this function that is thought to be significant in the ways that certain um, psychedelic-based religions uh, facilitate recovery from alcoholism and other addictive disorders. Okay, so we've covered the indigenous shaman. Now I want to move on to the neo-shaman or the psychedelic sitter. The training and practice for the neo-shaman uh, is much less well-defined. The practitioner may know of yoga, may have a meditation practice, may um, do Chinese medicine or acupuncture, and uses intuition and many uh, concepts from transpersonal psychology that are brought together uh, as part of his or her method for doing psychedelic sitting or guiding. 
The uh, neo-shaman is generally uh, naturally emergent or self-selected. A person says, I would be willing to sit for you, and I believe that I have the credentials to do that. Or an individual may say, I want you to do it, and uh, there's a little uh, training or apprenticeship program that empowers the, the uh, sitter or the guide to, to know what they're doing, accept their own direct experience and reading and uh, observing other people. The neo-shaman, again, has direct contact with the spirit world, enters into spirit reality through altered states, and often in neo-shamanism you see skepticism towards uh, monotheistic religions, allopathic medicine, especially psychiatry, and an overvaluation of the scientific method, which is known as scientism, which is the irrational overbelief in the scientific method and the uh, belief that scientific knowledge is somehow harder or firmer or more powerful or more important or more reliable than other kinds of truth. Um, I'm not sure why this ism is capitalized, but it, it, sh it shouldn't be. And neo-shamanism is a descendant of the uh, ideology of American transcendentalism, which I'll talk about in just, just a minute. And another distinction, and this is of course a generalization, uh, that shamanism, there is generally a greater emphasis on uh, searing pain, hardship, and terror than you see uh, you know, by and large in uh, neo-shamanism. The neo-shaman theory and methods are generally prohibited in prohibited discourse in medical circles. You know, when you are talking to oncologists or nurse practitioners uh, at the cancer center and you start using the language of uh, shamanism, you can see people start to roll their eyes and glaze over and stop, stop listening to you. And so since we're trying to persuade them to refer patients to us and to take what we're doing seriously, you know, this whole discourse is uh, prohibited, even though it may have a great deal of value in communicating uh, with uh, the subject in the study. So the neo-shaman, this discourse is not preferred in medical science, PET scans are preferred. And yet we have uh, many people who are bridges, Stan Groff uh, famously bridged psychiatry and neo-shamanism, and no course or no lecture on uh, 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 psychedelic therapy would be complete without giving credit to uh, James Fadiman, who has written this extremely useful guide, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, and Neil Goldsmith, his book Psychedelic Healing, and numerous others. So the mindfulness adept. Uh, it was clear to us early on that many of the practices and teachings within meditation are important uh, for us as practitioners and for the participants in the study to know how to do. Uh, and meditation is a technique for developing the skill of mindfulness, uh, focusing on self-regulation through careful attention, focusing on immediate experience, and developing curiosity, openness, and acceptance. One of the underlying themes that happens in existential anxiety is that there's little context to speak about the terror, rage, disappointment that occur in, uh, after the de development of a cancer diagnosis or cancer treatment. And the looking away, the uh, encouragement to cope, the encouragement to fight, the encouragement to be positive, all of these draw attention away from the most difficult, painful, searing, hard questions and processes that need to occur. And this, uh, the uh, capacity of curiosity, openness, and acceptance of what is that is central in mindfulness is something which I thought was quite important to bring to uh, training. Mindfulness and meditation is an established technique for entering altered states of consciousness with the idea that entering them can be uh, inherently transformative and bring about an improvement in outlook, mood, and connection to other people. Non-judgmental, radical self-acceptance are also important in uh, meditative practice, something which we bring uh, to bear with uh, each person as they prepare for their psychedelic experience. And the psychodynamic therapist. There are many, many things that we could say about what a psychodynamic therapist knows how to do, uh, but much of it is embedded in his or her own training. One thing that I think cuts across all schools of psychotherapy is that we help the patient develop alternative uh, meanings and narratives about life. We do that in different ways, we do that in different, with different techniques, but we all hope to help someone have a better sense of what their life means and how they can speak to themselves and understand themselves in it, and in particular here, cancer, illness, and death.
And narrative therapy is a particular form of therapy in which truth is not something which is discovered objectively, it is something which is constructed in the development of a narrative between the speaker and the listener. And this is a theme that I think comes up again and again when trying to understand how to use psychedelics in working with cancer-related anxiety. Like the shaman and the neo-shaman, the uh, Psychodynamic therapist believes in unseen forces. We don't call them spirits or ancestors that uh, exist in the spirit world. We call them the ego, the superego, the id, internalized object relations, internalized schemas. Many, many of these metaphors, I believe, are for the similar processes that occur. But uh, again, the psychoanalyst and the psychodynamic therapist is trained to work with these forces and just like the shaman, to intercede on the patient's behalf in order to try to make things better. Uh, within psychodynamic therapy, there is a deep commitment to a personal healing journey, extensive work towards self-knowledge and understanding of transference and counter-transference. All of these are invaluable in working with patients in our study. And there's a long history uh, that's um, uh, not hidden to the people who are here in this room, but certainly hidden within traditional psychiatric and psychoanalytic circles of using uh, LSD and other psychedelics to facilitate psychotherapy. And here are three books. This is this one in the right-hand corner I'd never seen before, and I was uh, kind of uh, 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 intrigued to see it uh, showing up in my Google Images search, Myself and I, with its uh, nice 60s graphics. Uh, now, psychodynamic therapy is very consistent with Western norms, medical, ethical norms and standards, so it fits in comfortably with what we're trying to do. So before telling you about the structure of our program, I want to do one more uh, uh, sort of theory-based little excursion and talk about set and setting. Uh, we often think about set and setting as the, the set being the, the, uh, the uh, participant's intention and the setting uh, where the therapy occurs. And in some ways, this is our setting. Manhattan streets, bluestone, this is uh, uh, the couch uh, that the uh, sessions occur on. But I'd like to suggest that there are two other contexts that I think are deeply influential in the work that we do. And these are existential psychotherapy and American transcendentalism. In particular, we work with Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. Logotherapy, I'm going to reduce it to just a few sound bites, uh, has as its core that life has meaning under all circumstances, even the most miserable ones. And this biography of uh, Frankl showing uh, this concentration camp march uh, at the top and then this very thoughtful image of him as a young man, uh, I think says volumes about uh, how he came to develop this uh, this uh, philosophy. He believes that our main motivation for living is our will to find meaning. And that when the search for meaning is blocked, there is psychological damage that occurs. According to Frankel, we discovered this meaning in three different ways. It's earlier today, Steve talked about meaning-making therapy, which is a kind of a practical uh, uh, technique for bringing these philosophical ideas you know, to bear in, in the clinical situation. So meaning is discovered in three different ways, by creating a work or doing a deed, by <clears throat> experiencing something or encountering someone, or by the attitude we take. So by creating, experiencing, or taking an attitude. Frankel says that everything can be taken from man but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Uh, this is his famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, and I want to point out that logotherapy is not a psychology of mind. It's not about the id, the e, uh, ego psychology, internalized object relations, uh, developmental stages, perinatal matrices. It's not about, oh, if you look, this is what we find, like you're, like you're making a map. It is an, a therapy of action about the creation of meaning, the intention, choice, and the creation of meaning. And uh, Irving Yalom can't be left out. American transcendentalism is a philosophy and a uh, form of literature which had its origins in the 19th century and in some ways lives on today in uh, the New Age movement. American transcendentalism holds in the inherent goodness of both human beings and nature. 
Now this is quite different than uh, Freudian psychology of the late 19th century and the 20th century, who said that the, in, the uh, inherent nature of human beings is filled with uh, steam, steaming cauldrons of id and rage and libidinal energy that needs to be modified and modulated in order to fit with the demands of society. It's quite different than American transcendentalism, which says that the individual is pure and it is society that uh, is corrupting. American transcendentalism is an inherently optimistic philosophy. There is a great deal of belief in the self and in the self-identity, in creativity and infinite possibilities of the human soul. There's a belief in spiritual progress and the interconnection of all beings, the immense grandeur of the soul, and that the interior is a source of goodness and wisdom. So I'd like to come back down to earth now and tell you about the structure of the training program that we have, and this is the, uh, the structure that we've used just in our last year of training, which is the third cycle of training uh, that we've offered. Uh, this is Shira Schuster, uh, who is soon to be a PhD and has been my co-instructor in the course for this year and has been a tremendous uh, uh, help and creative uh, force in uh, putting the uh, uh, training program together. So there are three core aspects to the training program. A one-year mentorship with uh, one of the three investigators in the study, Steve Ross, Tony Bosses, or myself. A didactic series and work with two study subjects. This is the schedule uh, with which we began last year. It unfortunately was, uh, you know, blown to bits by uh, Hurricane Sandy, but by about February, we started to recover and get back on track to all the, the, uh, um, the papers that we wanted to discuss. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the didactic first. I, I don't have all of the didactic papers here summarized, but uh, just a few of them. We start off with this fabulous paper by Matt Johnson and uh, Bill Richards and Roland Griffiths on the safety and basic medical knowledge uh, of psychedelics. This paper covers what 10 other papers would be needed uh, in order to, to convey the information about who is eligible, who shouldn't be uh, taken into treatment, what, is the, what are the risks, what are the basic techniques. It's a great paper and uh, offered a tremendous amount of information uh, in a quick, uh, uh, not quick, but in a, in a concise way to people who are going through training. The next is a, is a wonderful article by Alison Witta, no relation to, uh, to Stephen, who's uh, organizing uh, our conference today. This is a, a paper that I found in a, a journal on holistic nursing. She worked with nurses who um, had uh, work with people who are seriously ill in uh, western, eastern Kentucky, in Appalachia. And she looked at who had spontaneous mystical experiences while they, while they were in the hospital. Um, what contexts led to their arising? What nurses did that facilitated people being able to have mystical experiences, being able to talk about them, and what kinds of things the nurses learned about how to help the person utilize that mystical experience in their life afterwards. She also interestingly talked about the impact on the nurse that was doing the listening and participating in the creation of this, uh, this uh, shared experience. So this is a really useful article, nothing to do with psychedelics, but really about how do you occasion a mystical experience? What do you do that enhances the likelihood of that happening? We did some historical papers looking at uh, the <clears throat> LSD-assisted uh, psychotherapy and the human encounter with death by Bill Richards, Dan Groff, and others, and Pankey's uh, groundbreaking article on the transcendental mystical experience in the human encounter with death. We studied contemporary scholarship uh, in psychedelic research, Roland Griffiths et al.'s paper uh, on psilocybin occasioning mystical experiences. Uh, and we took a crash course in uh, uh, Yalom and Frankel by studying this paper by Bill Breitbart, Psychotherapeutic Interventions at the End of Life, a Focus on Meaning and Spirituality. So here, you, I think you're hearing again the ongoing theme of establishment of meaning as a core process that we encourage our therapists to bring to uh, people in the study. So that's the didactic series. If you want a, a copy of it, I'll be happy to send it to you by email. The next part I want to describe is the mentorship program. The mentorship program is uh, defined as just that and not as a supervision. Uh, we used the idea of supervision at first, but decided that mentorship is better for uh, several reasons. Uh, a mentor is more of a guide, a friend, a supporter, there's more equality in a mentor relationship than in a supervisory relationship. Um, 
and since all of the people that are, are trainees in our program are fully trained therapists, we felt that they were actually enhancing or developing or extending their uh, skills um, rather than learning something from scratch. So we use the term mentorship. Also, there's a certain amount of teaching that comes back the other way uh, that can be really quite profound. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. The mentorship relationship is confidential. The mentor doesn't say anything and holds the material found in uh, uh, men the mentorship sessions uh, with the equal confidentiality to what you would hear in, in therapy. The intention of the mentorship is an integration of all aspects of the experience. The trainee is encouraged to discover new aspects of himself or herself and others through the relationship. In other words, um, how does my existing identity as a therapist change, grow, transform? What do I leave away? What do I do more of? How am I changed in this uh, experience in learning how to do work with psychedelic therapies? Uh, and uh, a core part of the mentorship is dyad training. Now, when you work with two study subjects, which is the third part of the, of the program, uh, you work with your mentor for at least one of the uh, sessions. So each therapy team, each therapy dyad, uh, has to do dyad training. And the dyad training, which I'm gonna tell you about in a second, is the central part of the mentorship relationship at the beginning. So you meet for these six two-hour sessions doing dyad training, and by that time, usually you've gotten started with working with your first patient, so I mean, first uh, participant. So at that point, you're doing clinical work, you're talking about what's going on, you're talking about what's happening in the reading. But the dyad training is a central way that the mentor and the trainee get to know each other. The dyad sessions occur uh, six, there's six of them, they're about one to one and a half hours, and only the therapists are present. So it's a group of two, and what happens in there also is confidential. Each session has a defined theme, even though you're encouraged to do free-flowing discussion and talk about uh, anything that arises that you think is going to be relevant to uh, working together as a dyad team. And we used to have supervision after the third and sixth sessions, but I think that's pretty much like fallen by the wayside. So the goal is establishment of a close relationship. If you're going to be a dyad uh, team, you have to really know one another as therapists. Uh, you have to understand how somebody uh, thinks about life, death, suffering. I'm just going to adjust the connection. Okay. Uh, and when I, uh, when I first picked this picture, I thought that it was um, just kind of cutesy, but I realized uh, during one of the times that I've given this talk before that there's something quite similar between this tin can uh, uh, string telephone, and that's that you either are listening or speaking. And in order to change, you have to change your position. And the dyad sessions occur in the same way. Um, when you're speaking, a person is, is expected to uh, say what they have to say, describe their experience, and the other person listens. It's not a therapy session. You're not expected to ask questions to like deepen the experience, but it's a practice of a certain kind of meditative listening. The first session, uh, early memories and contemporary experiences of death and losses. Uh, family members, pets, friends, patients that have died. Uh, each person is, is invited to talk about uh, their life, from the earliest memories to the present time uh, of what death um, and mourning has been like for them. Uh, this is also the time to talk about early memories of awareness of your own mortality and thoughts and feelings about your own death or the death of uh, loved ones. The second uh, dyad session is an invitation to talk about uh, profound mystical uh, or spiritual experiences, including uh, experiences with entheogens. So the confidentiality uh, is also a part of the protection of this because speaking openly about uh, um, entheogen experiences or psychedelic use uh, in a context like this brings about uh, certain kinds of ethical and legal uh, anxiety in people. So only with confidentiality, I think, uh, are people really free to speak openly about uh, what they've done, what they've not done, what it's meant to them, and the part of them that they're going to bring to their uh, uh, dyad work, to the work with a participant that relates to their own experience or lack of experience with entheogens. They can speak about their experience as a sitter and as a guide uh, with shamans or guides or meditation teachers that they might have had. Um, uh, and this allows a, a basic kind of groundwork to be, to be established uh, between the dyad as they're getting ready to uh, sit with someone who's going to enter into a state which is rather unpredictable in terms of what they're going to be confronted with uh, 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 
holding. The third session involves looking at pain and suffering in family members, friends, and patients, and experiences with cancer or other terminal conditions, uh, including experiences in working with patients who are disfigured and whose bodies are failing, and the impact that this has. 10 minutes? Okay. So, session four, near-death experiences. Session five, <laughs> <laughs> beliefs regarding heaven and hell and religious history. Session six, uh, extreme states in uh, psychotherapy. But actually, by, by uh, session six, uh, everybody's pretty much done, and we've talked about everything that there is to, to talk about. Okay, so that's the one-year mentorship, and I'm gonna skip over that and talk about the study uh, and what actually happens during the sessions. So I, I presented the slide before, but I'm going to uh, go over it again. You've got three prep sessions, uh, a dosing session, three more sessions, a dosing session, and then three more. So there's nine therapy sessions and two dosing sessions. The three preparatory sessions. This is the study room. It's what it looks like. This is a model uh, pretending to be in, uh, in session. And the first prep session. So during the first prep session, it's really divided into two parts. There's education to the participant regarding goals of the purpose of the study, timetable expectations, and education regarding the range of possible effects of the medication, <coughs> side effects, rescue medications that we have on board, what we're going to do to try to help uh, them through a difficult experience. And after that, then we do a history during, we, during which we take a psychosocial history, and in particular a cancer narrative, we talk about family, relationships, hobbies, work, political, social, re, you know, religious affiliations, experiences with psychedelics, meditation practice, and anything that you would want to do to, to get to know somebody and develop a, uh, a trusting relationship with them. The second session is a life review. In this, uh, we do a rather structured ex uh, exercise, which I'll show you an example of in just a minute. But you go over much of the same material. You go over where you were born, growing up, where you went to school, when your dad transferred to another state, uh, what happened when your grandmother died, you know, if you had to go into the service, like whatever these important turning points are in your life, we talk about them on a, literally on a timeline and ex examine the meaning of those events in the individual's life in order to see how their life has come to have meaning, how events were made meaning of, how catastrophe or disappointment or anger or ex exaltation moments uh, you know, were, uh, were given meaning and came to, to structure the way that their, their life worked. Uh, and in particular, in the life re review, we look at the cancer narrative, which has to do with how you reacted to the diagnosis, what the diagnosis meant, and the relationship between cancer, spirituality, and how the individual found meaning. So this is uh, a life review exercise. On the left-hand side, you can see birth. About two-thirds of the way across, you can see now. This is a, a man in his uh, uh, late 40s. And at the very right-hand side, uh, he writes his death. So you can see between birth and now, there's many, many uh, events, and I'll give you a close-up in just a minute. And as about halfway through, you can see that he didn't leave enough space, which was like the, the proportion wasn't right, so he wrote a little U going down to write in some more information. And this is a close-up of what he wrote. Um, at the bottom, he wrote his regrets, lots of friends, he had to care for his mother when he had pneumonia. He was mean to Scott when he was a kid and did well in school and, and became a quarterback. All of these were things that he felt were important. And just getting this information, writing it here, and taking this time was really a profound experience for him. And each person that, that we work with uh, says, you know, I've never done anything like this before. And it's quite illuminating to have these memories sought in this relatively structured way. And then the third is taking a spiritual history. Uh, in order to take the spiritual history, we use these two mnemonics, the HOPE and FICA. And I'm going to skip over this because I'm running out of time. Uh, but these, you know, information about these is, uh, is easily available um, online. The spiritual history, what are your beliefs? More about the spiritual history, more about the spiritual history. The dosing sessions. Now, I'm not going to say a great deal about the dosing sessions because what we do is not vastly different than uh, what is written about quite extensively, how we handle people uh, in various kinds of situations, what we expect, uh, what we invite them to do, how we handle crises. This is really quite extensively covered by many, many people, and what we do isn't terribly different from it. We have headphones with music. The therapists take a supportive role and respond actively if necessary. We have an opening ritual. The focus is on uh, internal direction 
and immersion in the inner experience. The therapists are invited to watch, listen, and be attuned, and very careful listening to the first uh, post-journey narrative. Usually around two or three, the person sits up, takes off their headphones and eye shades, and starts talking about what they've been through. And this first uh, narration of the experience is really quite important, and uh, listening to it in a careful way, I think, sets the groundwork for how you're gonna work with it in subsequent sessions. Then you have a closing ritual. So, the integration sessions, these are the less, least well-defined part of the, of the process, and they vary considerably from one dyad team to another. And uh, while there is an effort in, in academic research to have uniformity and to have a manualized approach to things, I think that these integration sessions are a place where it's going to be quite a challenge to do this because what the person brings, what happened to them in their session, and who the therapists are, and the bond that they've tied, uh, the bond that they've made, the tie that's happened uh, among the three of them is really going to define what happens in, in the integration sessions. So again, making meaning of the psychedelic experience and incorporating that meaning into one's perspective uh, on yourself and in the world is an essential part of what we're trying to do. Now this is Reverend Mike Young, and this is a, uh, a slide that uh, I, I didn't know about this quote, and it was uh, Cody Swift actually that turned me on to this wonderful quote. And this is uh, in some ways the idealized experience in which the ego, which is constructed by memory and uh, determines what we think. Under psilocybin, you transcend this ego, it's not who I am, and that the loss of self is not as threatening as it was before. So this is kind of the idealized experience, and this is a picture actually of Marsh Chapel, where the Good Friday experience uh, experiment happened, and people praying uh, in that very same chapel. Uh, but not everybody has this full experience. Uh, some people have a much more biographical experience, and uh, I don't think I've read a, a description of what you need to do better than what came, um, came forward quite recently in this, this lovely small monograph by Torsten Passy uh, describing what kinds of things can happen in session. Uh, and I, I don't think that much of what's here is going to be new to anyone here, so I'm not going to go through this uh, in the interest of time. And again, even, uh, well, one point that I wanted to make about this is that um, sometimes you hear, you know, like when, you, when people are talking about Catherine McLean's uh, report on openness, that uh, 14 months later, uh, openness was found to be increased by a single psychopharmac psychopharmacological event. And when that phrase is used, it really reduces the experience to the drug itself. And I think that the mystical experience is sometimes seen as kind of like the magic that brings about some kind of transformation without being contextualized in a certain kind of uh, uh, therapeutic process. And I'd like to suggest that it really isn't quite this way. And that even uh, when a full mystical experience occurs, the way that it is held, the way that it's worked with, the way that it is uh, applied and connected to the individual's life is very much a part of a therapeutic process that occurs. So what have we learned from working with our trainees? This came out of a, uh, a discussion that I had with uh, Steve Ross and Tony Bossis uh, a month ago, and I've got nine points that I want to make, and that'll bring me to the end of my talk for today. There is a complex relationship between spiritual states, cancer narrative, and experience with uh, altered states. Now, we hear these words, and these words are said a lot, but actually sitting with people uh, and trying to figure out what their cancer narrative means to them, what their life meant and how life has meaning, how cancer affected the meaning in life, and the relationship of those two to this one psychedelic experience. That is, those are like bridges that need to be made and they need to be made actively. Uh, just sitting back and saying, so like, how was it for you? Is not really going to bring about a very powerful uh, connection that, you know, unless it's already happened. So this complex relationship, I think has much to be found and discovered about it, but it's quite important. Secondly, that there's a great variety uh, in the way that um, spiritual distress and existential anxiety present themselves. In general, the greater the mystical experience, the less activation or the less active integration is needed. So this is what the, you know, some of our mentors uh, have felt, that when it's a more full mystical experience, 
the integration sort of happens on its own or kind of happens naturally when uh, it's less and there's more of a biographical or psychodynamic, then more dynamic work is needed. Number four, involvement as a therapist in the study brings about deep personal changes in the relationship to cancer, death, and therapeutic stance. For me, this had to do with facing patients who were dying and talking about dying, looking at my own feelings about death, illness, pain, cancer pain, my mother's death from cancer. All of this got activated in me, and, and I realized how much I had been living you know, once or twice removed from these very deep existential issues because when you work with addictions, you're almost always working with somebody who's going to have a new birth and new, uh, uh, a new life in sobriety, and there's really you know, much of a, of a hopeful perspective. So this, this reduction in, in uh, uh, lifespan and the threat of dying from cancer uh, you know, brought about a change for me. On the other hand, I work with, uh, as a therapy, uh, in my therapy diet, with somebody who's been uh, working in cancer care for 15 years, and her attunement to defenses, denial around cancer, cancer anxiety, uh, diagnosis anxiety, the way that somebody clearly hears or doesn't quite hear information that they've got is very, very refined. And for her, imagining this new technique, this new way of helping a certain kind of suffering that she was so familiar with. Uh, uh, was really quite different for her. So for her, it is like, what is a psychedelic experience for this particular patient going to do for this very familiar form of uh, uh, cancer care that she's done? Um, number five, and this is like you know, beating a dead horse, the centrality of the construction of meaning to the uh, healing existential anxiety due to cancer. Uh, core processes that were necessary for the therapist is the cultivation of authentic presence, meditative attention, balance between uh, overactivity and overinvolvement, usually caused by anxiety in the therapist, or detachment, which can be caused by like an overvaluation of a certain kind of calm or a certain kind of meditative observation when a more engaged or forward-leaning approach might be helpful. And the skills helpful in uh, bringing about a mystical experience. Each therapist's trajectory is embedded in his or her own past and path and that there's a great value when you're doing short-term therapy like this to know how to work with patients, to know about transference and counter-transference and skill about what to open up, what to leave closed, how to work with things that emerge, how to handle crises that arrive, arrive, how to handle the subtle things that are important that you might not recognize or might not notice if you weren't well-trained. That There's a great deal of value in uh, being a well-trained therapist. And number nine, the unquestioned value of personal experience within theogens in uh, working with integrative sessions, especially in working with difficult passages during dosing sessions. So I'm going to sum up with two slides. So I want to talk about the goals of the training program. There are two sets of goals. One are the goals for the therapist, so they're goals that go in, and the other are goals that go, that go out. The goal of the training program for therapists is to develop the capacity to support spiritual and mystical experiences in the subject, and to relate these to illness and mortality and existential anxiety. So to conduct short-term therapy work that integrates spiritual experiences and facilitates psycholytic work. So these are a lot of words to encapsulate what I think is you know, really the core task of what we're trying to do, and that is be both psychedelic therapists and psycholytic therapists and short-term dynamic psychotherapists. The therapist's goal is to become a safe, skilled, and knowledgeable in all aspects of the process, meaning patient selection, patient preparation, handling the, uh, uh, the session and whatever occurs to the psychedelic session and whatever occurs in it, and the integration that happens afterwards, whether that's three or six sessions or for several years, which can occur. You know, one of the people who was in, uh, was in our, our uh, research uh, study stayed in treatment with her, uh, her dyad for several years because it was just clinically the best thing to do. So being able to know when to do what is a very important part of uh, uh, adding this kind of technique to your work. And lastly, to support each therapist's talent, maturity, and individuality, and to practice therapy that is creative, adventuresome, and unknowing. And by that I mean where um, the therapist is comfortable with not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing what should happen, but having an open mind and an open heart to be ready to respond to what does happen. And the external or the far-reaching goals for the training program, uh, these are out for the community. First, to define a training process and evaluate its effectiveness in an ongoing way. 
So we had to develop a, uh, a training program before, you know, without any training ourselves and without actually having done very much psychedelic psychotherapy in this particular context. So we sort of hit the ground running and now by the third, third uh, round of training and that we've done 25 uh, subjects in the study, I'm starting to have some preliminary ideas <clears throat> about what's effective in training, what's important, what's not so important. And so creating a training process was an essential part of what I was trying to, to do. And, and in order to do this, I just started with one that I thought up and did it and said, okay, how is this working? What's important and what's not? The next is to provide education and a normalization of psychedelic discourse within a highly traditional medical setting. So in this study, uh, information goes out to departments of psychiatry, departments of oncology. We have a journal club. Uh, the PGY4s sometimes come to our lectures and the fellows in addiction psychiatry and in other fellowships are invited to, to attend. So there's a place where psychedelic uh, medicine is being taught and talked about. And uh, when we go to the cancer center, we talk about this. So even though only 25 people have actually enrolled in our study and received dosing, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people in the NYU area have heard about the study and are seeing uh, psychedelic medicines <clears throat> being taken seriously and being studied in a rigorous academic way, uh, thereby creating a conversation for um, uh, sort of reintroducing these, these agents into our discourse. Third is to prepare uh, the needs for a phase three study, in which we would need, uh, you know, be doing two or three or even 400 uh, subjects in the study, so we need a lot of therapists for that. And third, to, uh, to establish uh, at least one model for a post-rescheduling wor world. In other words, if we are going to have uh, psilocybin offered as a form of therapy and therapists are going to offer it, how will they be trained? What will that therapy look like? How will we know when someone's a good psychedelic therapist and somebody who is uh, you know, not pulling their weight or not doing a good job? And with that, we'll bring it to the end. Thank you very much for your attention.